Animal spotting guide on Kilimanjaro Safari, which we are on right now. And we are going to log this for you on a separate vlog, and we're going to have a good time. And here at Disney, Walt Disney World Resorts, Animal Kingdom. I see these animals are where they might appear at, especially at this first area. This is the Little Eteri Forest, and it's home to many species of reclusive forest antelope. Like the Okapi, you can see the distance to our right. Okapi are the closest known relatives to the giraffe. Believe it or not, they're actually the only other member of the giraffe family. They're that close, they're related. Much closer to us are these saddle bell storks. This is a female first, you see the yellowish green color to her eyes, and then the male second. He has a brown hazelnut colored eye. They stand about over five feet tall and have a wingspan of about nine feet. That's about the size of the width of the canopy above your heads. They are much larger than they appear from up here on the truck. You can see all those animals on this truck. Those are coffee back there are solitary animals, unlike the giraffe. Much more like the black rhinoceros. You can see in the distance to our left. So there are also some bongo on our right. I think we'll see some more on the corner. It's always exciting to see a black rhinoceros. Even better to see two as we are now. There's only around 5,000 of them left in the entire world. They are commonly poached for their horns because many people believe they have medicinal value. But that's not true. Rhino horns are made out of keratin. That's the same thing that makes up your fingernails and hair. They are the smaller of the two species of rhino on our reserve, but they still weigh about 35 to 100 pounds a piece. They can run at speeds of about 35 miles an hour. There are quite a few oh, look, 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 coming up here look, look, on our right. There's a red brussel and animal. Even it, a few breed of kudus going up. Some light gray colored ones. Oh, Both male look and female bongo have that. these backwards oh, with horns on their head. That lets them move very quickly through the brush, pushing branches look, 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 and brambles look, 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 out of the way of the rest of their body. But that's not the case of the greater kudu, as you can see. There's two on our right, one coming up on our left. Only male greater kudu oh, have any horns at all. We're gonna get one up close the here. ones they have are substantial. And it means the ones here in the forest are definitely female. They are the second tallest antelope species on the reserve, but again, everything looks so much smaller from up here in the truck. Remember that the armrests on either side of our road sit six feet from the ground. That'll come in handy if any other animals get close to us today. Both those bongo and greater kudu have light colored vertical stripes on their bodies. Really interesting so far. These stripes wow. look a lot like this sunlight is, is streaming yeah. through the canopy, so it is excellent camouflage in the forest. Well, we are no longer in the forest, friends. Instead, we're descending deep into the Safi River Basin. This area is home to animals like the Nile hippos. You might be able to see on the right. If you can't see this, don't worry. We're going to be looking out for a few more up ahead. From what I saw, those hippos are almost completely under the water, which is how you'll typically find hippos. That helps to keep them cool. And despite their large size, when they are under the water, they can look like shadows or ghosts moving around down there. There are some here on our left. Might be a little bit easier for us to see. No, is how they have their eyes here. Oh, there, there they are. They're right are. up on top of their flat head. That lets them keep the majority of their body under the water while still being able to breathe and keep an eye out on their surroundings. And most can hold their breath for up to eight minutes at a time and can even sleep under the water. While they are asleep down there, they will rise to the surface, take a breath, and descend and once more. Yeah. All without waking up. They are some pretty talented animals. Now, hippos don't really swim. Instead, they sink to the bottom of the rivers where they live and walk or hop around down there. And at night, they'll get out of the water and travel long distances on land. To communicate over those long distances, they use a sound called a wheeze honk. Every hippo has their own unique sound, and the more dominant a hippo is, the more often they'll be responsive to their wheeze honk. But we're also seeing the Nile crocodiles here on our left. Each one of these crocodiles can grow to be as long as a giraffe it is tall. That's around 18 feet in length at their maximum size. The ones down here aren't quite that big yet, but they do still have some growing and some life ahead of them. There's not really a biological cap to how old they could be, so under excellent circumstances, there have been some very old and very large crocodiles indeed. The Nile crocodile is famous for its powerful bite, and it is an exceptionally powerful and strong enough to snap right through the bones of their prey. But also gentle enough that mother crocodiles can be seen holding their eggs in their mouths. This softens up the exteriors of those shells and makes it much easier for their babies to hatch. But this is our first look into the next area on our reserve, the savannah. Savannas are home to some of the more famous animals that live in Africa, like lions, elephants, zebra, and giraffe. 
from this point overlooking the savannah, you might notice a lot of the trees here are trimmed back to around the same height. This is around the height of the adult giraffe that live here. This is no coincidence. They nibble up all of the leaves they can reach at their eye level, trimming back that canopy and allowing sunlight to reach the savannah floor. This grows grass that'll be food for some of the other animals that live here with them. This is the ant cooling cattle we'll see on our right, just around this corner, or the wildebeest eeling off in the distance. Now the horns on these and coley cattle, you can see very well to our right, can be eight feet from tip to tip, but they are almost completely hollow. They're made of an internal honeycomb-like structure. It's really more of this spongy substance that allows blood to circulate through them. As it does, it radiates off heat, circulates back into their body, keeps them cool. The same way a radiator on your car helps keep your engine cool. We are seeing those wildebeest on this hillside in the distance there, but also some Hartman's mountain zebra a little bit closer to us. Zebra and wildebeest are two species of migratory animals that live on the savannah. They'll travel many miles throughout the year, following the rains and the season, searching for fresh food and water. As they do this, they trample down some of the larger plants that poke through the grass. This behavior helps keep the grassland a grassland, and it's a way these animals will manicure their surroundings. To our left, we are also seeing two spotted hyenas, one's munching away here in the grass, one's asleep there in the den. Hyena are famously matriarchal. Every female in a clan of hyena ranks higher than every male does, meaning that when a baby girl is first born, she already outranks her father. Contrary to popular belief, hyenas will hunt for their food far more often than they scavenge for, but they'll take a meal when they can get it. When they do scavenge for food left behind by other predators, it's yet another way these animals will clean up their surroundings. Now the Hartman's mountain zebra here on our right, unlike the other animals on our savanna, are not native to savannas, though they do very well here. They are native to the mountainous regions of Central Africa, hence the name Hartman's mountain zebra, and they have several adaptations to let them live there well. Such as larger hearts that pump blood more efficiently at higher altitudes, and smaller, more pointed hooks than other species of zebra make them pretty nimble and sure-footed over the rocky terrain where they live. You can tell what species of zebra you're looking at, though, based on the stripe patterns on their bodies. Hartman's mountain zebra like these have white stripes on their rear legs, skinny stripes in the center of their body, and leaves them with that completely white belly. Very different from the grubby zebra that you can also find over at the Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail. We're getting closer to these wildebeest up ahead and here on the left, but we are also finding one of the eland I mentioned when we first came out of the savannah. Actually, both of the eland. One is already on the right side of the road, a female, and I think the male is going to be crossing the street behind her. This male stands six feet tall at the shoulder, weighs a thousand pounds. It can jump six feet straight into the air. They are some incredibly powerful creatures. I think they have the most obvious dewlap here on the reserve. That's that lot, large flop of skin you can see hanging down beneath their neck, but especially his neck. Blood travels through the dewlap and cools them down, a lot like the horns of the Ankoli cattle. But the Hartman's Mountain Zebra have a dewlap as well. The wildebeest coming up are part of the largest land migration of any animals on Earth. A herd in the wild can be up to a million individuals, and they'll travel up to a thousand miles a year in search of fresh food and water. Now I know it's difficult to imagine what a million wildebeest would look like together, so if you had a million of them in a single file line, the line would travel from right here in Orlando, Florida, past Toronto, Canada. That's about as far as they'll travel throughout the year as well. Wildebeest are also called the new, spelled G-N-U, that name comes from the sounds that they make. I've heard those sounds been described like a cow mooing, but with an accent. And speaking of cows mooing, those angolic cattle that we saw back there will moo at us as we drive past from time to time. I like to think it's their way of reminding us that they are one of the only two species of domesticated animal that live here on the reserve. There are quite a few of these wildebeest that live here, aren't there? We're going to continue seeing them up ahead. But on our left, I think we are going to be seeing a few of these, yes, Maasai giraffe hanging out here amongst these palm trees. Now, despite the long neck of a giraffe, there's only seven vertebrae in there. No, it sounds like a lot, but it's the same number of vertebrae you have in your own neck. Theirs are, of course, much larger, and it leads to them having a smaller range of motion in their neck than you might believe. It's difficult 
for a giraffe to reach all the way down to the ground from a standing position. They can definitely do it, and you might have seen one do it in the past, but what they do, it's a very vulnerable position for them. So they'll spend most of their lives standing up. They can even sleep standing up. Is the best view yet of some of the wildebeest on our right. Adult giraffe back there only need to sleep around 30 minutes a day to remain healthy, but if they feel they are in a safe environment, they will sleep for much longer periods than this. The giraffe on our reserve can be found sleeping for several hours, but never all at once. They'll take short naps throughout the day and night, getting all the sleep that they need. Over this hill. In between these two big baobab trees, friends, we are going to be heading into some elephant country. Let's keep our eyes open for any African elephants that could be here on the left or up ahead of us. And look at that. There are actually quite a few of them out and about this evening. You can tell these are all African elephants because of their ears. Shaped a little bit like the continent of Africa, where you can find them in the wild. Their ears are much larger than the ears of their Asian counterparts. Elephant ears have many different functions, used for far more than just hearing. They can be used to display emotion between elephants and even between elephants and humans. And as they wave their large ears around, it creates a draft past their body. The wind comes by, cooling off the blood in those ears, keeping them cool. Very similar to the way the horns of the Ankaldu cattle we saw earlier on help keep the cattle cool. Now, the most famous way that elephants have of cooling themselves down, though, is by throwing dirt, sand, or other materials on their backs or their trunks. This acts like a natural sunscreen. It physically keeps the sun's rays off them, which is important. They have sensitive skin and are prone to getting sunburns just like we are. We might see a few more elephants up ahead, but we are definitely going to be seeing this whole flamboyance of greater flamingo. Flamboyance is what you call a group of flamingo, and it happens to be my favorite word to describe the group of animals here on the reserve. As the name might apply, they are the largest of all flamingo species, but they still only clock in at around 9 pounds, fully grown. Now this is a pretty exciting time of year for the flamingo because a few of them are nesting here. You can see them sitting on these large mounds of mud and dirt. Those are flamingo nests. Each one has a single egg inside of it, and I'm crossing my fingers that we'll see some hatchlings here on this island sooner rather than later. But first hatch, they are incredibly small. These little gray fuzzballs that are almost completely spherical. But again, they don't reach their size for very long. Elephants, on the other hand, don't reach their full size until they're almost 12 years old. Which means that young elephants are small for a very long time. That longevity comes at the price, though. Mother elephants are pregnant with their babies for 22 months before giving birth to them. It is the longest pregnancy period of any animals on Earth. Now, based on the size of the elephant we got a glimpse of right there, and the fact that it seemed to be alone, I would say that one was definitely a male. Elephants are part of a matriarchal species. By the time that male elephants have reached maturity, if they have not already left their herds, they will be driven from them. While they are still relatively young, they can form batch of their herds together. But as they get older, they will break off and live on their own. The adult male elephant is a solitary, territorial creature. As we turn this corner, look to the left, because there are a few cheetah up on this hillside. Now the sun is going to set a little bit, they're actually a bit easier for us to see. Though they have some pretty fantastic camouflage, really disappear into the surroundings when they sit a little bit further back than this one is. Cheetah do that helps them when they're in the wild, because cheetah are ambush predators. They will hide away in the tall grass in the savannah and wait for their prey to come close. When this happens, they use their incredible speed to cross that distance in just a second or two. They are the fastest land animals in the world, after you all. You don't say. We saw them running now, the these dark. cheetah have been just a bit far away for us to hear, but they meow and purr in the same way that house cats do. They can even mimic the sounds of birds they hear around themselves. This lures birds in close to their hiding places and makes them much easier prey. But despite these incredible vocal variations, they are still absolutely incapable of roaring like the great cats they live with on the savannah. Cheetah are more closely related to lynx and circles and other lesser cats, like house cats, than they are to great cats like lions. Now I am looking out for some lions on this rock formation to our left. You call rock formations like this a kopi, it's spelled K-O-P-J-E. These red rocks soak up a lot of heat from the sun there today, but it makes a nice place, warm place for animals to hang out on top of. Let's see if there are any lions here this evening. They have been a little MIA this afternoon, but we are there's, seeing the male up one. here on the left. 
Yeah. Now this is how you'll typically find lions inactive around 20 hours out of the day. Not necessarily asleep that whole time, but definitely inactive. Male lions like that big guy weigh about 400 pounds, with 40 of those pounds coming from their manes alone. It's about 10% of their body weight hanging around their necks at all times. For the three lions that live up there, wake up, get up, and roar as loud as they can, which they often do early in the morning and again later on in the evening. You can hear them up to five miles away, so keep your ears open while you're out in the park. You might just hear a lion roaring at you. To our right, we are seeing a little bond buck there on the ground. This is one of the oldest bond books in captivity in the entire world. He's a testament to the fantastic care these animals get on the reserve. But those are also some ostrich eggs. Each one of those ostrich eggs weighs about five. Stand on them without them cracking whatsoever. There are three ostrich on the reserve. They are all female, but they are like chickens in the fact they will lay eggs, whether are they whether they are males around or not. And again, there are no male ostrich here on the reserve. But we are now leaving the savannah behind us, and it said we're going to be heading through the Magadi Glen. This is the outskirts of the village of Harambe. That's where I picked you up at earlier, and that's where I'll be dropping you off at once more. It does get a little bumpier than this youth area than usual, though, so I want to remind everyone to hold on tightly to anything you don't want to leave here in the Glen today. Now, it's always nice to see the little bonds bug back there, because a hundred years ago, there were only 17 bonds bug left at all. A single farmer in Central Africa was able to crowd them up on his land and keep them safe both from predators and from poachers. And that's why we're able to enjoy its presence on the savannah today. This being said, many of the animal species on our reserve are critically endangered in the wild. But the Disney Conservation Fund has worked very hard to increase the numbers of these animals both in the wild and on reserves such as this one. They can do this thanks to help from donations made for the general public. And if you would like to donate to this fund, you can do so at any merchandise location here in Animal Kingdom. But the easiest and most accessible way you have to protect these animals is to go home and tell people that you know about the animals you've seen today and the experiences you've had seen. The more people that know about these animals, the more hands are available to help protect them and their environments for the enjoyment of future generations. But these waterfalls mean that we are reaching the end of our safari tour. So please take this opportunity to look around and make sure you won't be leaving anything behind you on the truck. Things tend to fall out of bags and pockets on the bumpy road to the reserve. It hits a long trek back to Africa if you could get something with us. If there are any wilderness explorers with us on the truck today, you've all been riding on the symbol one. That is S-I-M-B-A and the number one. You can fill us in on page 14 of the wilderness section. Alright, that was a Kilimanjaro safari.